Yankee Stadium, Friday, June 11th, 1948. It's pushing midnight. Cleveland is up by two, but the Yanks have the bases loaded. Cleveland's Bob Feller delivers to Yanks pinch hitter Sean Waller, who <sighs> strikes out to end the game. The game had a little of everything. A Joe DiMaggio homer, a 20-minute rain delay, and in the fourth, Yogi Berra was tossed for arguing balls and strikes. And that wasn't all. Just three hours and change before that, most of the 67,924 pairs of eyes were fixed on the infield, not on DiMaggio or Rizzuto or Yogi, but on 22 dogs whose handler's eyes were fixed on their trainer, a diminutive, trouser-clad woman, Blanche Saunders. The next day, the New York Times reported, A pregame obedience test exhibition by 22 trained dogs won the fancy of the spectators. Under the direction of Miss Blanche Saunders, the performance was roundly applauded. I'm Bud Bacone, inviting you to sit and stay as we tour the surprisingly modern story of canine obedience and introduce you to some of the remarkable breeds who inspired it, including the standard poodle, who pitched two and a third shutout innings that night against the Yanks. It's a southpaw. Look it up. from the AKC Archives. <laughs> September 1934. The Great Depression was five years old. That summer, both Time and the FBI caught up to John Dillinger. For weeks, a heat wave devastated the Midwest with temperatures in St. Louis reaching 110. Crowds everywhere retreated to movie houses, as much to see James Cagney in Here Comes the Navy as to enjoy newfangled air conditioning. Now, history had enough on its plate that it might be forgiven for overlooking the arrival home of Ms. Helene Whitehouse Walker, fresh from six weeks of obedience training in England. Yes, really. Earlier that year, Ms. Walker had imported an apricot poodle, Tango, from England's Piper's Croft Kennel. And Tango had come with something few other breeders provided, comprehensive obedience training. Now, in those days, obedience training as a sport was terra incognita to North American breeders and handlers. Dogs that required training, such as uh, hunting breeds or patrol dogs, would be shipped away to professional handlers. Weeks or months later, the dogs were returned. Owners would receive a set of instructions, but no actual training. In England, things were different. Obedience competitions were becoming hugely popular. So thither went Helene Whitehouse Walker, who was determined to learn the skills of what she called a thrilling sport and to impart them on millions of Americans. Her secret weapon? The standard poodle. Written off by many as a prissified, ploofy, oversized lapdog. A breed we can trace back not to France, but to Germany. Here's an AKC breed biography. The first clue is the name, Poodle, from a low German word meaning splash in the water. And yes, uh, bonus points for guessing it comes from the same root as Puddle. Dating back centuries, Poodles were bred as water retrievers, fetching ducks for their handlers... And though the French love their poodles, there's no such breed as the French poodle. In fact, the French name for the breed is caniche, meaning duck dog. By nature, poodles are eager to please, athletic, and what Bostonians call wicked smart. Their bad rap dates back to pre-revolutionary France, when they became a royal favorite in the court of Versailles. And poodle cuts? That's an interesting story. I, I wish I had the time to... T well, what the hell? Uh, hold it a minute. Uh, hold it! Hold it! 
Hold, hold, please. This will just take a moment. I'll, I'll need to show you some slides in your head if that's okay. When I suggest you picture a standard poodle, the poodle clip you probably imagine is this. See that? The dog's face, throat, feet, and base of the tail are shaved. So are the hind quarters and legs. Above the hind feet are bracelets, and above the front feet are puffs. There is a pompon at the end of the tail, and sometimes on the hips. The coat is left full on the head, neck, and upper torso. This is called the Continental Clip, a style tied directly to the poodle's origins as a hunting dog. Shaving some of the poodle's coat allowed it to move more easily in the water as it retrieves game. Keeping hair grown around joints and vital organs protected the dog from exposure to cold. Now that's the English saddle clip. You see in your mind's eye how it's similar to the continental clip, one key difference being that the hindquarters maintain a short layer of hair. And that is the sporting clip the one pet owners are most likely to choose. The face, feet, throat, and base of the tail are shaved. Most of the rest of the dog has a uniform one-inch cut. And where were we? And that's our AKC Breed Biography. Ms. Walker never set out to champion the poodle. She'd had little to do with them until January of 1931. She and her father decided to buy a dog as a birthday gift for her sister. Her father had gotten to know poodles while staying in England years before, so a poodle it was. When it arrived from England, it was Helene Whitehouse Walker who first brought it home. And that's when it happened. As she later recalled, I didn't have him more than 24 hours before I was crazy about him. Now, it's uncertain what the sister got for her birthday that year, but it wasn't Jason. Ms. Walker compensated her father for his share of the gift. Jason became founding sire of Carolyn Kennel, and Ms. Walker became a poodle evangelist. Now, at the time, poodles would compete in a miscellaneous category, and that wouldn't do. So Ms. Walker formed what would become the Poodle Club of America, recognized by the American Kennel Club in 1931. Now that she'd shown the sport what poodles can do, Ms. Walker and her poodle set about showing America what dogs could do. But there was still one human missing from the equation. If there was a Neil Armstrong moment in the story of dog obedience in America, it was when Tango met Blanche. One afternoon in 1934, a gray sedan negotiated a dusty farm road in Brewster County, Massachusetts. A young woman operating a haymow watched it turn into the barnyard where its two occupants got out. One was the driver, Helene Whitehouse Walker. The other was the passenger, an apricot standard poodle, Tango of Piper's Croft Kennel. History does not record what Tango first thought of that young farm worker, Blanche Saunders. Ms. Saunders, for her part, later recalled the meeting with a backhanded compliment. You mean that's a poodle? She later recalled saying, I thought they were horrid little white things with runny eyes. As Genesis moments go, it was uh, underwhelming. It was years later that Blanche Saunders would admit, I didn't know it then, but Tango was a very important dog the granddaddy of obedience in America. Ms. Walker had come to meet the young woman who responded to her ad for a $20 a month kennel maid to work at Caroline. Saunders, who had a college degree in agriculture and animal husbandry, had little experience with canines beyond teaching a few tricks to farm dogs. Within weeks, Tango and his kennel mates would soon transform her. Obedience trainers speak of a personality change they undergo, a, a fringe benefit of what dogs teach them. For Blanche Saunders, the transformation she underwent from the dogs of Caroline was profound. Within a month, she became kennel manager, embracing obedience training methods Ms. Walker had imported from Britain. Ms. Walker began organizing obedience demonstrations. When she coaxed officials of the North Westchester Kennel Club into letting her stage a demonstration, her dogs were the hit of the show, 
as she put it, the spectator appeal was so fantastic that nobody paid any attention to the judging of the breeds. Now, in 1936, she persuaded the American Kennel Club to acknowledge obedience as a sport. Still, Helene Whitehouse Walker was just getting warmed up. First, she'd put poodles on the map. Then she had to legitimize obedience training through the AKC. Now she was determined to sway the entire nation. That's when Ms. Walker and Blanche Saunders hit the road. And this was a legendary road trip in the dog world. The sort of story that's uh, sung in ballads and told around campfires and, and documented in a 1951 profile in The New Yorker. And the back seat of Ms. Walker's Buick was repurposed to accommodate three of her Carolyn poodles. Glee, <coughs> Joya, <coughs> and Bancor. And Bancor. <coughs> Behind them, a 21-foot trailer, which included a dog diet kitchen, the five set out in an obedience training equivalent of barnstorming meets revival meeting. Wherever they heard there was a dog show, thither they went. The stars of the show, of course, were the three poodles who sat, stayed, healed, and if they had opposable thumbs, would have driven the Buick. From New York to Wichita Falls, from Houston to Los Angeles, 10,000 miles in 10 weeks past who knows how many Burma shave signs on depression-battered roads decades before the great interstate highways. Obedience training took root across America, and three poodles had done the lion's share of the teaching. When Ms. Walker closed Carolyn Kennels during the Second World War, Blanche Saunders continued to preach the obedience gospel, leveraging mass media. She wrote articles and enormously popular books. She appeared on radio. She gave demonstrations at Rockefeller Plaza, Madison Square Garden, and yes, Yankee Stadium. And in 1946, she was featured in a series of instructional films based on her work. I'd just like to take a moment to point out that we have a new member of the uh, panel. <laughs> Obedience training and standard poodles such as Robin found their way into the heart of popular culture. My name is Blanche Saunders. My name is Blanche Saunders. My name is Blanche Saunders. By the early 60s, when Blanche Saunders appeared on television's To Tell the Truth, spoiler alert, she was contestant number three, she had helped tens of thousands of American dogs train their owners. She'd become the human face of obedience training to millions of Americans. Okay, maybe not to Johnny Carson. And I watched the dog's reaction to the voice. Mm -hmm. And that's why I voted for number one. Thank you. <laughs> and Betty, which one do you think is the real one? In just 30 years, a few dozen standard poodles and two women had given obedience training nationwide status with a confidence and a voice that were all but impossible to disobey. Will the real Blanche Saunders please call her dog? Here, Muggsy, here, Muggsy. Yeah, go, Nina, go, dog. Nina, come. Robin, come. Uh -huh. In 1964, Blanche Saunders died of a heart attack at 58. And so it was that Robin, Tango, Glee, and their kin helped provide obedience training to millions of Americans. Based in no small part on skills honed generations earlier in Europe. Maestro? <laughs> If you were anybody who was anybody in early 1800s Europe, you would have heard of Munito, the standard poodle who could read, write, count, tell time, and play chess. Were he around today, he could almost certainly complete an IRS 1040 tax form. 
Just watch this. Munito's handler has asked someone in the audience to pick a card. It's been put back in the pack, shuffled, and the cards placed in a circle on the stage. Munito is slowly circling the cards with his nose down, and he's... wait... Ah, false alarm. And there. He's nosing one card in particular, and yes, it's the one chosen by the audience member and whispered in the handler's ear. The genius of Munito, of course, was his ability to respond to subtle cues and commands from his handler, commands imperceptible to the audience. One reason for Munito's fame was his longevity. One reason for his longevity is that he wasn't a dog so much as a franchise. Picture the Dread Pirate Roberts on four legs. Early in the 1800s, Munito, the Water Spaniel Cross, toured France and Italy. A couple of decades later, Munito, the White Standard Poodle, wowed audiences throughout England, including Charles Dickens. So famous was Munito that he, or she, won mention throughout contemporary popular culture in a story by Edward Bulwer Lytton, the dark and stormy night guy. Jules Verne mentions Munito in his novel A Captain at 15. In personal letters, composer Franz Liszt and author Alexander Pushkin each lamented that the public regarded them as trained dogs, like Munito. Throughout those early days of the Industrial Revolution, urban populations grew, as did new forms of entertainment for large groups of city folk. In this environment, several dog acts toured the cities of Europe, with dogs, very often standard poodles, exhibiting faux intellectual and psychic skills, but also remarkable physical feats. They would somersault, walk tight ropes, even box on their hind legs. These dogs were no small inspiration to the likes of William Nelson Hutchinson, a British Army officer and inventor who created his own obedience training pedagogy. He would write, It is hard to imagine what it would be impossible to teach a dog. Did the attainment of the required accomplishment sufficiently recompense the instructor's trouble? And gradually, new obedience training methods began sprouting up in Europe through the 19th century and into the 20th. In 1919, an organization formed in England to promote the training of dogs for what they called criminal work, presumably uh, law enforcement and tracking. Its original focus was on Alsatians, a popular name then for the German shepherd dog. The organization called itself the Alsatian Sheep Police and Army Dog Society, or ASPADS. Later, as other breeds were introduced, the A was redesignated as Associated. The group had adopted obedience training methods from handlers from continental Europe, and over the next decade and change, its reputation grew. Enough so that the organization was visited by an American, Ms. Helene Whitehouse Walker. It was there she gleaned many of the methods she would take back to America and eventually impart on Blanche Saunders. Through the eyes of a novice, an obedience trial is a competition among dogs. No, Blanche Saunders might have been quick to tell you. It's really a test of handlers. You can almost hear her utter her favorite expletive. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Now look closely, and you'll get a sense of the strengths and personality traits that distinguish one breed from another. For verily, all breeds are not created equal. We're not talking better or worse, just different, the way people are different. Which raises an interesting question. The story of obedience training is dominated by the standard poodle. It was so with circus-type acts of the 19th century, and it was so through the growth of obedience training in America. Besides the poodle, researcher Dr. Stanley Corrin suggests that the Border Collie, the German Shepherd Dog, Golden Retrievers, and Doberman Pinschers are among the breeds most conducive to training. Hounds and Terriers, not so much. As Blanche Saunders once told a reporter, Terriers are too busy, and hounds are too sniffy. Then there's the dachshund. Bred as digging dogs, they're short on legs and long on personality. They can be brave to the point of rashness and uh, decidedly independent-minded. I think the dachshund 
the smooth hair dachshund is the uh, not brightest, but a genius. That's Iris Love, acclaimed archaeologist and tireless advocate for the dachshund. Makes sense that she would gravitate to digging dogs. Ms. Love was lost to COVID-19 in April 2020. Through her storied life, she loved to breed and train dachshunds for the very reason others steer clear of them. What they lack in altitude, uh, they tend to make up for in attitude. In an interview for the AKC Archive, she once articulated perfectly the breed's relationship with obedience training. They like to be the people who give the orders. Through the last half century, there's been something of a renaissance in thinking about breed attributes. Some thought, instead of dogs competing to perform a uniform set of tasks, what if their skills were honed according to what they were bred for? Take the uh, Newfoundland, for instance. By the 1970s, members of the Newfoundland Club of America lamented that breed aesthetics were being valued well above behavioral traits dogs were bred for. So they did something about it. They began developing a series of water trials, tests to encourage the breeding of Newfoundlands to excel in the skills they were bred for. Plans were made for water trials consisting of a dozen exercises, which led to the club's first official rescue test in Lake Michigan. During time, rules were tweaked to play to the Newfoundland's natural instincts. Like so many breeds, the gentle, drooly Newfoundland has a rich heritage well worth celebrating. A good place to start being St. Charles, Missouri. Here in Frontier Park is a large bronze statue of three great explorers of the early 1800s, Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, and Seaman, Lewis's Newfoundland. Lewis valued Seaman for his docile manner and his skill as a hunter. He hunted squirrels, beaver, even a pronghorn antelope, providing food for the party. On May 29th, 1805, Lewis wrote that, Last night we were all alarmed by a large buffalo bull. The bison had crossed the river and was running full speed through the camp. Seaman not only sounded the alarm, but he also ran ahead of the bull, diverting its path and saving members of the party from being trampled. Lewis wrote, We were happy to find no one hurt. (coughs) And so it is that a number of clubs have reached beyond traditional obedience trials to develop breed-specific tests and competitions helping rediscover purpose-bred traits honed for generations and even centuries. Among them, lure-coursing trials play to the purpose-bred instinct for chasing. To pass, a hound running alone must pursue a lure, completing the course with enthusiasm and without interruption over a given time. Almost as if, this time, dogs talked and people listened. If you run into a word cop anytime soon, please pass along a beef for me. The word obedience in the sporting sense feels misleading. It has come to imply that a dog has been trained to conform to the whims of a human trainer. When in reality, obedience is the sport of tapping into abilities for which dogs are already hardwired. As Blanche Saunders spent her remarkable career stressing, obedience begins and ends with training humans, instilling an understanding of who's in charge, learning body language, and discovering that sweet spot between discipline and patience. Still, we humans might cut ourselves a little slack. Dogs, after all, have been purpose-bred for generations, some for centuries and some since antiquity, while modern obedience training has only re-emerged in America over the last 80 years or so. The occasional expression of angst from Blanche Saunders notwithstanding, Oh, for heaven's sakes! Thousands of passionate handlers are proving year after year in competitions all over the country. Humans can be taught. Down and b- Down and b- Shh! Tales from the AKC Archives. Visit akc.org to learn more about all things dog and find bonus materials for this episode. Follow us on Instagram at American Kennel Club, on Twitter at AKC Dog Lovers, and let us know what you thought of the show. 
founded many, many dog years ago. AKC is the recognized and trusted expert in breed, health, and training info. AKC is all about responsible dog ownership and dedicated to advancing dog sports. No humans were harmed while making this show.